podcast and I'm delighted to be able to welcome this week's guest, Mark Hicks, who's um, a good friend of mine and a restaurateur and chef of some notes. I first met Mark years ago when we were um, first supplying restaurants in London. Um, when, we, when we first called up, Mark was the executive chef of the Caprice Holdings Group, which includes restaurants like the Ivy, Le Caprice and uh, Jay Shiki's. And when we first called some of the, the chefs at those places, they were very enthusiastic in their response to us based on the fact that Mark has always uh, showed an interest in wild food. Um, but at that time, they, they didn't have a regular supply of any of the stuff that we were um, proposing to supply them with. So they, 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 um, they all of them quickly opened accounts. And not long after that, I got to meet Mark in person. Uh, and he's all shown a great interest in what we do. He wrote the foreword to my book, The Forager Handbook, and um, also put stuff in in, uh, in his book about regional British food, uh, featuring a lot of what we do and, and, and telling our story. Uh, Mark really plays down what I feel is probably the most important aspect of his, organize, uh, of his um, restaurant business, which is the way that they champion small suppliers and that they champion issues of sustainability. Uh, not so long ago, we had an email from one of Mark's chefs saying um, that they didn't want us to send any plastic with our orders for them anymore. And, and they're the only restaurant that allows us to send the plants out in paper um, because he said Mark has given up plastic forever. And that's uh, something that a lot of people would probably try and make headline news out of. But I, I don't think Mark has spoken publicly about it at all. It's just something that, that, that he does alongside the championing of uh, sustainable fisheries uh, and other aspects of the um, the way he runs the Hicks restaurants that it's just being done because that's the way he sees that it should be done rather than it being done as a way of earning kind of brownie points in terms of PR and, and, uh, and publicity and so on and I think you know it's it's a great example of how things can be done because the the restaurant industry is, is hugely influential and also has great purchasing power. It has the potential and the the ability to support all kinds of artisan producers who, in their all in in their own small way, are doing something to change the way that food is produced and supplied. Um, and I'd be interesting. I wish I thought to ask, but um, to know from Mark just how many small producers he is actually supporting through the um, five or so restaurants that are in the Hicks group now. So without further ado, we'll, we'll, we'll move on to the conversation and uh, I hope you enjoy it. So I'm here with Mark Hicks. We've, we've taken a choice. Mark Hicks has two habitats. One is, one is in Lyme Regis in uh, Dorset. The other is a studio flat in London. Well, we've, we've chosen the latter because it was slightly more convenient. Here we are, hello Mark. Yeah, how do you? So, yeah, yeah, so that's my kind of escape at the weekend. So it's half, business, my half business and half pleasure. Yeah, no, because of course you've got a restaurant, restaurant down there yeah. as well. Yeah. And that, that element sort of keeps me sort of fresh in, in contact and connection with the local fishermen. Oh, that's a good thing, yeah. So I thought, I thought you were going to say it keeps you sane. It does as well. <laughs> right. So I do a bit of gardening, a bit of fishing, and do quite often hang out with a local fisherman because I'm, you know, I'm interested in their stories and I've got a boat down there and I always call them oh, first right. to see where they're, where they're catching or not catching. Yeah, yeah. So I have a bit of a head start. Uh, and you know, some of the local fishermen I work with, they, I've sort of weaned them onto certain species like, you know, pouting for example, which is something they would just throw back in because they're a pest. And so I, I persuaded them to keep some of the bycatch like pouting. So what's and a pouting like? So pouting is a bit like a whiting. It's like right. a sort of miniature cod, almost. Oh. Uh, and, you know, they're, they're normally about that size or that size. Uh, but, you know, if you just sort of use... Sorry, that was, that was roughly 10 inches and roughly yeah, a foot? Yeah, roughly, yeah, yeah. And, you know, they make very good eating. So what, what I do, uh, what I'm, I actually keep those fish. And I fillet them on the boat. And I put the fillets into seawater for about five minutes. Mm. And that sort of firms up the flesh a little bit. And yeah, they're delicious. You can use them for ceviche or you know deep frying and batter. And so I've, I've sort of taught some of the local fishermen about this because they you know they they were valueless really, so they would throw them back or use them in their lobster pots. 
vape. Mm. Uh, so I now buy them often because, you know, some of my friends there, they're commercial bass fishermen, rod and line, and they'll go out and have a great day, and then the following day they'll, they'll catch zero. Uh, so at least, you know, buying some of the bycatch, whether it's uh, hus or pouting or whatever, uh, it helps pay for their fuel. What is hus? Is that the same as dogfish? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So dogfish is the common name amongst fishermen. Uh, you know, I wouldn't put it on the menu as dogfish, but there's... Um, lots of different species of the hus. Um, they're basically a small they, shark, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so they, you know, they, they go from sort of taupe um, down to smooth hounds and bull hus. But they, you know, they make very good eating. I mean, our, our curry at the fish house is ninety nine percent hus most hmm. of the year round. Uh, you know, got a nasty sort of sandpaper like skin. But again, I persuade the local fishermen. So I've got a section, not a section, but I put BC next to the bycatch fish, so our fish soup, for example, is bycatch. And sometimes a turbot can be bycatch because, you know, some of the fishermen are, you know, netting for sea bass and they get one turbot. So it's not worth sending, you know, a single turbot to the market. Oh, you're so, joking, so they throw it away? No, they don't throw it away, but I'll, I'll, I'll take it. But, right. but it's, class, you know, classified as okay. a bycatch, so it's mm. a non-targeted species. Mm. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, so I, th- I think it's quite fun, you know, it's, it's also interesting that, you know, when they're netting, you know, there's a lot of crabs in the net, um, which they have to sort of literally pull out the net, so I take the crab tools off them and, and the shells, you know, to make soup with and things. So it's just making that whole, you know, fish thing sort of, you know, friendly for the fishermen and friendly for us and the customers, really. Well, it's kind of making it less industrial. I mean, I always, I always think that the, the, the problem with an industrial thing is it, it will do lots of one thing. Mm. Mm. And uh, the difference between that and something organic is something organic, there's always loads of stuff going on. And the system's geared up to make sure that all of the loads of stuff is playing an active role and it's all good and it's all mixed in together. <coughs> yeah. And you've got a diverse... Yeah, healthy and, situation. You know, using a hundred percent of you know even the guts and stuff right. from the fish right. when they come in, I, I get my guys to save the the muscle sacs and they mix the guts and heads and things with oats and I use them as a um, rubby dubby bag you know for when I go fishing for sea bream. Okay. So you, you tie that to your anchor basically, right. and then the um, and they keep it in the freezer so as it defrosts. You know, it lets sort of fish oils and things ah, out. And, and that tracks, tracks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So nothing goes to waste. Okay. The EHO and inspector didn't think much of it. They said, what's that bag? I said, that's the bosses. He uses it for fishing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you're not, you're not making that ancient uh, sauce from rotten fish guts then? No, no, I've not got onto that yet. No, no. no. But also, you know, sea salt is another interesting thing. There's, there's someone just started called Dorset Sea Salt. Uh, and this guy called Jethro, which is a lovely old-fashioned West Country Classic. name. Yeah. And he's making small production sea salt in Portland. And I'm always surprised, you know, so there's Cornish sea salt, there's obviously Morden sea salt, and uh, the Welsh one, uh, Hallen Mon, and that. But there's only like sort of four proper sea salt producers, you know, an island that's surrounded by sea. It's the same as the point about the seaweed that we are making yeah. earlier. So I think, you know, there's lots of opportunities there, you know, producing salt. Yeah, when you, you've got patience, you can make the salt yourself and you make it in the bathtub. <laughs> but, you know, there's lots of opportunities out there. Sure. We just leave some seawater sitting around for long enough, it will yeah. reduce down yeah. the salt. Yeah, no, exactly, yeah. It normally ends up on your shoes or your boots. Yeah. I mean, I think it's great, great that the... You know, the influence that a few restaurants can have just, just to get people's attention to some of these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And some of the, you know, some of the species I sell down there, you know, we struggle to sell in London. Oh, right. Uh, and also, like the painting thing, I wouldn't buy it because, you know, after a couple of days, it's not that great to eat. But, you know, when it's fresh off the boat and you can capture it like that and wash it in the actual seawater mm. itself, you know, it really does an extra shelf life on the fish but do you think do you think in london it's, it, it it might be um just like a d- demanding a different role from your front of house team to yeah to no, no. really <coughs> explain it to the guests because yeah i'm sure there's a lot of people eating out in london maybe not everybody but i'm sure a, a good number that, that, that would jump at the chance to, yeah. to see their meal <coughs> well i see you um 
A, something different, and B, making a difference yeah, by, by using yeah. the bike hat. Yeah. There's um, things like pouching that you can use as uh, fish and chips. You know, yeah. you can just call it fish and chips. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And the fish, you know, the, the things like the husk and the curry, just call it fish curry. So it's not, uh, it's not like you're using those words, because then the cottons rely, unfortunately, on your front of house staff to sell a sort of third division fish to a customer that easily. But, uh, I don't know, you see, this is, this is a bit of a bit my it's a bit like this, you know, It's a bit like some of this stuff, I suppose, in a way. But, you know, some of it is a hard sell, and if, uh, if your person type of house isn't that clued up on it all, because uh, that, that, that's a big thing, is actually, you know, getting the staff to actually Yeah. Sell it. Well, I was going to say, this is a bit of a personal uh, hobby horse of mine at, at, at the moment. It's, you know, to, to hear you talking about, okay, we're bringing this stuff into the restaurant, which, which would otherwise get thrown away. But, you know, that restaurant is, is, is a way to really broadcast that to loads of people. It is, yeah. It's a great education for the customer. But... It's the front of hat with any of these things, with, with new products that no one's using, or things that are done in a more sustainable way, or, or more locally with fewer food miles and so on. Um, it's the front of house that's going to really make that sing or not, isn't it? Like, mm. And, and I, I think most people are missing the trick on that. You know, yeah, what you yeah. need is your front of house is, is people that are real. You know, they're, they're on fire about it. Yeah, they they recognise yeah. that what this restaurant is doing right now is is helping to shape public attitudes in order to make things better. Yeah, yeah. But if they don't realise that, or if they're just not given sufficient information, I mean, you're right about the plants. I, I often find I eat out and, and the front of house serves me my stuff and doesn't know how to yeah, actually yeah. Do correctly yeah. define it. But, you know, I, I think it's a missed opportunity. When If, 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 if restaurants saw their um, daily job, not just as, you know, extracting money from people's wallets, mm, mm. but actually, for real what it is, people are coming to restaurants and having their attitudes to food changed as a result. Yeah, yeah. And, and I, think, I think it's like most people leave the restaurant without having had the experience that they could have had if they just understood what it was they just ate, you know. Yeah. If yeah. they had all of the story behind it and why it matters and why it's important and why Mark chooses to do it that way, yeah. they'd go home going, flipping that, you know, and they'd probably change their yeah, eating yeah, habits yeah. in the next few months. So yeah. like, it, it's, it's to me like it's a point of contact with, with a missed opportunity. Yeah. Pretty, pretty much, for, I mean, I know not all restaurants care at all about these things, but something like yours where, where you clearly do, mm. I think it'd be... Yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. And even, but even common... Things you know, the staff often get it wrong. You know, things that they should know, or you know, where that piece of fish comes from, even though we put it on the menu. But it's you know, I, I, even though I was brought up by the seaside, you know, it was only later in life that I started learning a lot about you know species and what you can do with them, and you know, seashore vegetables and all that sort of stuff. Well, that's what this is all about. It's just stuff that's under our noses that we're oblivious to, isn't it? Like, and and. Uh, and yeah, I think that, that what we're seeing now is, is just great because people are, we're all just becoming more conscious of what's under our noses, basically. Um, I mean, I was going to ask you, like, what, what, what um, you know, what first inspired you to engage with some of the foraging and stuff? Like, how far does that go back for you? Well, some of the obvious things, you know, I sort of used a little bit, but you were probably, the, you know, back whenever it was. Back in I think we first met in 2004, or possibly early 2005, yeah. Yeah, so you, you, you were the <coughs> person really that sort of, you know, introduced me to, you know, 95% of the stuff that I know about now, you know. I knew, I knew about mushrooms and all that sort of stuff before, but mm. the, you know, the kind of stuff we're looking at now on the table, uh, you know, wasn't sort of in my radar, you know, it's uh, cool. And I pretty, I think you also you, you also um you were quite evangelical with that um Roger Phillips book, weren't you? The, yeah, the, I mean that classic I've, Roger Phillips I've had that book for you know twenty five yeah. years. Yeah yeah. And you know I, I think even even today it's still you know it's been reprinted so many times mm. and even in a small pocket version I think. Yeah and a great big fat mm. version. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and even Robin at the Peak Hotels they have one of each hotel room. You know, especially the one in the New Forest. 
and uh, people that and because you know the photographs even though it was what 30 years ago or something you did that but they're still very much uh, current aren't they you know yeah well i mean wild garlic doesn't go out of date that's the beauty of it no exactly and, the, you know, and even the photographs even the mushrooms you know they're very good for identification well but i mean i think that's 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 what <coughs> came in with that strength he basically has got that total grounding in photography yeah. Before he even thinks about writing a book about wild food, he knows he can yeah. definitely yeah. produce these beautiful images to convey it to all. Yeah, yeah. And it's, yeah, but it's great that those books are still kicking around, and a lot of people don't know who, who he is. But uh, I think people that are into their wild food certainly you know he's a, Yeah, he's kind of a, 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 a wild food sort of household name for the, yeah. the wild food community. Yeah. yeah. But I wanted to mention as well, because we, we're in, it, it being um, July, it's exactly 10 years since publication yeah. of it doesn't seem that of long. our book, it doesn't seem that long ago. Good. Yeah, and for listeners um, should, should know, Mark, Mark wrote the foreword to my book, The, the, the Forager Handbook, um, which was great, and it's got lots of his recipes in there. Um, but it's, you know, I, I think it's a great... Um, Thing to have on your shelf in you know the the, uh, the much your cookbooks because you know whether you live in London or the countryside you know we're surrounded as you pointed out. Well, we're going to go out in a minute. I yeah. mean, and, and, and look at some of the salads you have growing yeah, immediately outside. It's not there. Yeah, but yeah, exactly. They, a lot of this stuff is very unfamiliar with uh, you know the general public. But I think the more people get to know about this stuff, you know, things that you know are classified as weeds. That they would spray weed kill on in their yep. garden, you know, they should be encouraged to keep it, you know, whether it's bitter cress or all that sort of stuff, but, you know, commonly grows in everyone's garden. Yeah. It's just realising that what you think is a problem is actually an asset. That's, that's what I think so beautiful about it, is, is, is it's a complete reversal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. even the old stinging animals that you were talking about earlier, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting that, you know, you said that they use them for making clothes yeah. during the war. Yeah. Uh, they're fantastic fibre. There was, there, was there was a project a little while ago that was funded by DEFRA called STING. Um, one of the universities, that might have been Sheffield or something like that, up north. But there's a whole kind of project with, with academics and, and practitioners just looking at sort of modernising the, the nettle production. And, and they found this fascinating thing. So in the past, there was a process called retting which had to happen. So you get, you get your... Your, your nettle that dies back in the autumn, it's, it's a, like a cane that's left there when the leaves all die back. Um, and you cut that and then you put it in a pit with, I forget if it's lime or ash or something. But anyway, that, that sort of rots down the, the, the smaller fibres and moves <coughs> you with the, with the big ones. But what these guys found out, which I think is just fantastic, is like just, just a bit of modern observation and scientific investigation. They discovered that if you just leave these canes to sit there over the winter, come back in the spring, you don't need to wet them. So it's just like a whole stage of the process, yeah. totally not necessary. So yeah. then we've got ready wetted canes, and then and then they just bash them and get the fibres out. I've mucked around at home, but I haven't got very far with it. There's a lady up in Scotland that's, that's been doing this all her life, making <coughs> fabric and, and stuff yeah. out of nettles. So there's the, the, and there's a what is it? There's a company in Yorkshire. They make a fabric from nettle fibre and and uh, sheep's wool, and up north, a lot of the buses and trains, the upholstery is made from that. Really? You know? So, it's, it's, so it's, I mean, it's a, it's a future thing, I think. It's, yeah, it's yeah. like we, we, if, if we if we if we saw these wild environments, okay, we're gonna we're gonna use the nettles for greens in the spring, uh, then we're gonna eat the uh, the seeds in the autumn, mm. and they're giving us like all this medicine and energy and everything like that, and then we let them die back and. And we make clothes out of them. It's just perfect. It's perfect. But again, it's the multiple benefits thing, Mark. Yeah, it's yeah. the opposite of an industrial yeah. model. Yeah. Those things are also feeding caterpillars in the meantime. You know, they're part of the ecology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we're surrounded by these, these things. Yeah. Things. We're surrounded by these things. And they have no inputs. Nobody's having to plow it, put pesticides on it. Nobody's having to do that. And, you know, I mean, I, 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 I kind of dream about how far we could take this. But... Now the fact is that ecology is is really kind of strong and resilient and produces loads of stuff. I just wonder how far we can go. Just I mean, it's just taking the same thought that, that you've got about the fish. You know, let's let's. What if we found a way to work with all of it mm. so yeah. that 
you know, we're not disrupting the system by just taking one thing out, but we're taking a little yeah. bit of everything. And yeah. I don't know. I've, I, but I just, I just think, as I say, the role of restaurants are almost at the coal face of public attitudes here. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, yeah, it's um, interesting. It's also interesting down in Dorset that the, I don't know if you know, back in the early 1900s, there was, they used to catch bluefin tuna up on the east coast right. up near Scarborough. Yeah. And it was actually... Didn't they call them tunny? They call them tunny, yeah. yeah. And they were basically feeding on the herring, you know, sort of herring fishery. And old gents used to go out in these little tiny boats tied up to the big boats, um, with these big heavy rods and their tweeds, and you catch uh, tunny. And they were tied up because these fish were like five or six hundred pound fish, and it would just take them off. And then they disappeared with the herring. But the last two years down in Dorset and Devon, these massive bluefin tuna have suddenly showed up again. Amazing. There's, um, I've got photographs here from back in the Scarborough time. If you're able to share those photographs, Mark, can you stick them, stick them on the yeah. with the notes again? It's quite interesting. So, so fishermen were c catching these bloody great blue fins by mistake in their nets and stuff. Um, so this this would have been back in the 30s. Yeah. And then this, this was off Devon last... Amazing. So, People have been sighting massive shoals of fish this size. Yeah. You go on YouTube, uh, yeah, yeah. tuna off Devon. It's incredible, and bluefin tuna are endangered. And there's like thousands of these things coming in the, off the coast. So that, you know, the sea is changing, and the mackerel, which were common down there, are very rare this year. You know, mm. we hardly catch any mackerel because the Icelandic fishermen. The guys in Kent, we, talk, we were talking to some fishermen yesterday. There's <coughs> Yeah, yeah, because the Icelandic fishermen are taking their full quota of mackerel now. Oh, right. Um, so they're not migrating over here. I mean, what is your thought on, on, on managing global fisheries? Do you, do you... Yeah, I mean, I think there's, you know, seasons need to be introduced more. So down there, there's, you can't fish for scallops at a certain time of the year on the, the Dorset bit, but you can then fish in the Devon, so you're resting the Dorset bit for rebreeding. So the fishermen swap between the two. And, you know, there's fish that, you know, should be uh, fished more seasonally, you know, since they stopped trawling uh, like an eight or nine mile, they made, a, they made a line bay into a, a marine reserve, the Blue Marine Foundation. Mm. It was the first blue uh, mm, yeah, yeah. marine reserve. And then suddenly all the cod started uh, coming back on the reefs and, uh, you know, feeding off the fish that would have just got trawled out of the reefs. So it's, so it's interesting that you can go out and catch all those different species now. And uh, when, when the cod were short, you know, the fishermen were catching loads of pollock. So the pollock are, you know, less common now, and the, the cod are more common. Well, funny enough, there's a, there's a, there's a study that, that was done, uh, I think, in somewhere in Newfoundland. Um, there was an island, there was an indigenous culture there which they had some detailed records going back a long time. So they did this kind of study looking at uh, a food web, you know, as if it was any other species, but it was people um, in this place. And they, they, they looked at the food web and they came to this conclusion and said, well, this food web is almost identical <coughs> to the food web of cod. Because what cod do is that they feed and feed and feed on the thing that's most abundant. And then just at the point when the abundance starts dropping off, they move on to something else, which is which has suddenly yeah. become abundant. Yeah, so that yeah. one recovers. Yeah, yeah. And then they move on. So what, what they describe the cod as is a, is a flexible on the wall. Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if, if the global fisheries thing shouldn't be just ultra responsive in this kind yeah, of way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To, yeah. To, to let's just go for the thing that's really peaking at the moment. Yeah. I mean, some, you know, some of the old fishermen from sort of, you know, it's been in generations, kind of went with it and stopped trawling, you know, and sort of started targeting different species further out, you know, which is great. And, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're funny old guys, fishermen sometimes, they, you know, they're a bit anti the system, but it's actually their future, really. Yeah. Is important. But is it, is it, isn't the answer that we should just stop trawling altogether and, and just have these, these little boats going out? And yeah, I think there's, you know, there's, there's, there's different types of fishing and, you know, some of it is harmful, some isn't, I suppose, you know. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult subject. But, but I mean, I suppose the thing about it, it, the, 
the big trawling boats going out there, that is industrial fishing. And it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's um, on several levels, but one of which is that there's, there's a big fat greedy bloke at the top of it, yeah. making shed loads of money. Yeah. And there's yeah. lots of minions. So, I mean, I guess it's still quite well paid to be on a trawling boat, but, yeah. but basically it's not very equitable. No. Whereas the idea of smaller, yeah. independent fishing businesses, yeah. both going out and catching yeah. everything carefully, yeah. that works for everybody, doesn't yeah. it? Apart from the big fat bloke at the yeah, top. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, exactly. And, you know, the, that we're trying to get rid of. The yeah. sort of you know, there's no border as such, you know, so the Spanish fishermen can. And French fishermen can come and fish in our waters, yeah. but we can't go and fish in their waters. And there was a thing that last year I saw in a paper about I think it's scalloping. Was like, there was a couple of English boats had gone quite close into the coast in France. And they were sort of almost like the old cod wars, you know. Right, 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 yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that was spectacular back in the day, wasn't it? Where the navy got involved, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 This kind of cod wars. Fishermen do break the rules, but. But they, they soon get, you know, they soon get um, found out, you know, in their quotas and stuff. I mean, even at the fish house, now, we if, if we buy from the local fishermen, we have to fill in a form of the name of the boat, you know, species, uh, so that all goes back into the system, and they're, you know, for their quotas and stuff. Yeah. It's well, not, on the face of it, that seems like a good thing. Yeah, yeah, so it's not just a case of, you know, giving the fishermen some money for whatever fish, you know, it's all being recorded now, which is great. I mean, I suppose where people kick back against it is because it seems uh, bureaucratic or it seems like officialdom that doesn't actually understand the situation on the ground. But if you go back far enough to um, where all the land was inhabited by different tribal groups, yeah, there's no way that that was just a free-for-all. Yeah. There were, there were yeah. really very strict protocols and uh, almost, you know, that religious taboos, really, about you, you, you do it like this, you do it at this time, not at that time, mm, or it's mm. even this group of part of a tribe that does it, these guys can't do it, or whatever. You know, so, I mean, it always has been that way, you know, that, that the wild stuff was very carefully managed. But yeah, I think the yeah. issue now yeah. is that where bureaucracy gets involved, it can seem really arbitrary, and, and you just think, well, you don't even know what you're talking about. Well, right, have you got to come in and impose Yeah, this? yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, it's interesting what you said about the sea kelp earlier. Well, that is based on yeah, that is that. that I mean, the the, the 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 sort of the the move that um, Natural England did to I mean, they did successfully that that's because they they managed to convince the judge that that we were damaging the uh, shingle vegetation by walking on the shingle, which I think is just extraordinary. But the judge ruled in their favour that they they um, but they they did not manage to. Um, Produce a, a scrap of evidence that, that harvesting on the scale we were, which, mm. which is fairly substantial. Like we go down and take fifty kilos of leaf yeah, yeah. off a large area of shore, yeah, yeah. but um, you know we did that for several years, and the plants all grew back with, with no sign of damage. But they they still managed to make it stick on the grounds that um, our team walking up and down the shingle might stop other plants from coming through, in spite of the fact that our um, Highly qualified botanical expert uh, John Aykroyd said that was absolute nonsense. You know. But you know, in general, the um, the mindset that's there uh, is 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 very fearful about the collection of wild resources, and I think it's I think it's it's a mistake in how people are thinking about it because a lot of these conservation organisations was set up in the first place to address a problem that had happened with with industrialization. Mm, mm. You know, so people move into a given area, or like when people moved it, uh, and, and colonized places like Australia and, 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 and the United States, you know. But they moved in with no connection to land, no, no none of this social fabric that was in place to carefully manage the resources. And they're just like gung-ho, go for it, we just strip everything, kill everything, sell everything, you know. Whereas, what the point of reference that we have for this kind of thing, and I think it's the same one we should have for the um, for the for the managing the fisheries, is that sort of ancient setup where people very carefully stewarded the resources that they had, because they basically, at one level or another, more or less considered that the earth was their mother. You know, they just basically like, there's no way we're going to trash this place because we belong to it and it belongs to us. You know. 
that's the reference point that a conservationist, in, in my opinion, ought to have. When, when they look at wild resources being used, they, 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 they might look at the possibility that that kind of strong relationship between people and landscape is starting to happen again, you know, and the, the last thing that anyone yeah, wants to do. Got is, council, you know, plowing um, Alexander's from the roadside, didn't they? Well, up in, up, in, up in Norfolk, it makes me want to spit. They go around spraying it. The council spray the Alexander's. Like the vast areas, you know, so goodness knows what else is getting mm. killed by the, by, the, by the spray. It's just such a, it's an incredibly lazy thing to do. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's, it's, but I, I, I see it as kind of a bit of a blip. You know, I think, I think these guys, in the next 10, 15 years, they'll realise, hang on a minute, this is, this is actually really great, you know, that, that people are wanting to reconnect with land through using the wild resources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an opportunity, not a threat. You know? yeah. but, but it's, I just think for now, we're a bit stuck in that. You know, the Woodland Trust are banning foraging, yeah, yeah. the Royal Parks are banning foraging. I mean, they haven't, in my opinion, because in order to ban something, you have to have a legal yeah, basis for it. Yeah. And there is no legal basis. Naturally, they managed to find a little loophole with a... A legal instrument called a stop notice to stop us doing what we did at Dungeness. But just so you know, everybody, anyone can go and pick sea cow at Dungeness because that only is applying to to that only applies to my company. Yeah, you could go down and pick sea cow at Dungeness. There's nothing stopping you from doing it because it's not protected and it's not illegal. They'd have to they'd have to make a legal case for for, for there being um, harm or damage done, and, and they've absolutely failed to do that in in our case. But uh, anyway. I don't want to dwell on that negative thing because I, I just see all of the stuff that's happening with, with restaurants like yours, Mark, and, and the sort of social currents of so many people wanting to just learn how to pick a few berries and do something with it. And everyone can see that like, if you get your kids out foraging, the world will be a better place. You know? yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm actually tremendously cheerful about the opportunity that we've got now with, with, with people switching on to all this stuff that's under their noses. You know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you know, my grand is just sent me out with a basket, you know, and come back for blackberries. Yeah. Or and yeah, yeah, yeah. So where did you grow up, Mark? Dorset. Okay. Ah, right. Yeah. So you're, you're still you're still where you were. Exactly. I was going to ask you though, through this kind of journey you've had with wild food, could you could you um, do you have some favourites with the with the wild plants? Yeah, I do. And then and then all the things that I've got easy access to. So for example, my house in Dorset. It, both sides of the house, uh, there's lots of penny walks. Okay. And for me, it's my sort of go-to salad leaf. Yeah. It's kind of, it looks good, it tastes good, it's got a nice texture about it. Mm. And, you know, having penny walk with, whether it's, you know, game or vegetables, asparagus, you know, it makes a fantastic salad. It um, gives structure to a salad as well, yeah. isn't it? Because it's got these yeah. kind of quite solid umbrella-shaped leaves, you know. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's one of my favourites. And it's probably because it's easily accessible, really. Yeah. And people always want to talk about it, you know, so you give them a plate of that with whatever. But it just looks so funny, doesn't it? One of its other names is navel wart because it looks a bit like oh, right, yeah, your yeah, belly button. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that, that is kind of one of my favourites. But again, you know, stuff that I come across, uh, like all the seashore veg and stuff down there, especially with fish, you know, works really well. And, and then, you know, obviously mushroom season, you know, it's a joy to stumble across a couple of penny buns, you know, when you... Oh, the, you can't do better. It's just, I mean, I mean find, finding a, a penny bun or set, as the French call them, it just make anybody happy. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I could know, be I've got as miserable as sin if I found a pe penny bun, it would, it would sort me out. And I've got my little Very daughter good. into picking now, so I'll, ta I'll take her... Oh, fantastic. I'll take her down and, you know, she loves it. What's she got there? She's got cauliflower. Yeah, right? cauliflower, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, <laughs> big fat penny bun. Oh, that's glorious. And I took a, uh, the razor clams as well. Oh, I've never managed to successfully get razor clams. I've, yeah, I've, I've just poured salt into the hole of some very pissed off lug worms. Yeah, and there's lug worms come up. Yeah. Oh, I thought it, was a, thought it was a razor clam. Just a lug worm. Yeah. So, yeah, wow. all those things are great for kids. Is it, did, you, did, you, did you do that? Did you yeah, pour salt down the hole? Yeah. 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 They're getting kids into doing that. Yeah. It's much more interesting than... Well, I've tried to learn some times. Like iPads. Yeah, but my kids will still come out again. We could, we could go razor claim, despite the fact that I've completely failed every time I take them. It's still up for another go. And even like, you know, lifting rocks and collecting little crabs yeah. you know, to make crab soup. You know, oh, right. Yeah. Those, those sort of green shore crabs. 
So you just split some down. Yeah. yeah. And they, you know, because they, they're quite soft, you know, the whole thing blends up. So I've done that before, you know, sent them out crabbing and Fantastic. then made them some nice soup out. Yeah. And then I'm taking it down this weekend, so I'll probably try and catch some mackerel. It's funny, last year, she, uh, like the, the, the mackerel were really scarce and we, we haven't even had one on the menu in the restaurants. And uh, I took her out and we got a couple of carrier bags full of uh, mackerel and she wouldn't, uh, it's the first time she's really been out properly fishing and she wouldn't, she wouldn't let anyone else uh, pick them up and put them in the bucket. Like, you know, when they're six or five, I mean, get them into fishing like that. That's like, amazing. And presumably she's, she's eaten them with gusto when you get back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, <laughs> I can't imagine a child saying, I don't like mackerel if they've just been out yeah. fishing for mackerel. No, she, she loves it. Yeah. I think, yeah, I, you know, start the kids off wild food. Yeah, it's great. Well, it's the only reason I'm doing what I did. Yeah. It's just, that's what my granddad did with me. Yeah, yeah. Quite often there's a new waiter that'll bring you the kids' menu and she'll give it back to him and say, Can I have lobster? <laughs> So we're just outside on a patch of grass just outside Mark's flat. So we've got dandelions and then this, this little one here is with the purple flower. You wouldn't probably notice it unless the purple with flowers out. Now's the time to spot it where the flowers are drawing attention. This is this is self heal. That's just a mild salad leaf. There's not a huge amount of flavour, but I mean I think the great possibility with wild salads is you can you can you can potentially produce a wild salad with 30, 50, 60 ingredients in it. So Yeah, yeah. And when you know they've all got little micronutrients that the other ones haven't got, it almost becomes you kind of have a competition with yourself. You know, you're getting all of that good stuff. And I quite like these clover flowers, Mark. And they, they do taste sort of mildly of peas and a little bit of uh, salicylic acid. Um, and you just scatter them over the top of something, you know, mm. add a bit of uh, decorative effect as well. That one there is cat's ear, which is very like dandelion, but just a bit more coarse. There's a cat's ear pakora recipe in the, the forager handbook for that. One of my favourites, sow thistle. They're quite small and delicate, but these leaves can be can yeah, be huge. Yeah. So it's kind of a chicory endive type thing. And if you if you're looking at the nutrient side of it, it's full of full of omega three. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's a plant based source of omega three. And we've got a little bit of plantain here, Mark. So there's a leaf that tastes like mushrooms. It's so funny. You, so you can completely fool people with this. You can you can make a, a dish out of it and then ask what the mushroom is, and you say, well, it's actually a plant. But actually, it is. Mushrooms are involved in it. There's a microscopic fungus that lives within the plant that's giving it that flavor. Really? It's funny. The other day, Mike sent us in, and they're not from this country, I think, those yellow cordyceps. Oh, right. Things. I mean, they, they start off on the back of an insect. Yeah. Three weeks ago, I was in China for a few days, and the first meal I had, they were in it. Wow. And there was this other thing called a wild bamboo fungus. It's it a looks a bit like yeah. a stink yeah, yeah. but it's got a... A sort of veil coming down yeah, off yeah. the hat. Some of the markets in China are incredible because, you know, in spite of it being like this big sort of uh, communist entity, you forget that out in the rural areas there's still yeah. culture going back thousands of years yeah, around. Yeah. Plants, insects, yeah. fungi. And this is right in the middle of a sort of concrete jungle. 
and but it'll be coming in from the, the from the local villages and so on. Yeah. 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 Well, um, should we grab a few bits and make a salad? So what is it? What have we got? It's mallow. Uh. So makes most people think of marshmallow and that's quite correct because the, the root of marshmallow, which is a very similar plant, is what the original marshmallow would have been made out of. Oh really? Um, but this is still a very popular uh, green vegetable in Spain and Morocco and all across the Mediterranean. They just use this in place of spinach, basically. Really? You can find it on the markets in great big bundles and so on. Sam Clark from Morrow uses this. Yeah? Yeah, because he, he, uh, he learned about it on his travels. Or Sam and Sam, I should say. What about the flowers from the mallow? Yeah, absolutely. Again, they don't really taste them much, but they add a bit of colour. So we've got some nice slightly more substantial south thistle here that can go in one more plant there's always one more plant that you didn't notice earlier so this is gallant soldier and you can see it looks a bit scrappy yeah when i was researching for my book i found some of this in canterbury so i wonder what that is i looked it up saw people said that you could eat it but it was it was an ignorant judgment on me because it was at this stage i thought yeah but it's no good i don't like it but the obvious thing is at another stage of the year it, it, it's just got young leafy green yeah. growth it's fantastic yeah. But I missed it out of the book. Like miniature daisies, aren't they? Hmm. So it's, yeah, it's related to daisies. But then I went to Brazil, and I was hanging out with this guy called um, Valdely Kinnup, who is the kind of wild plant guy in, in Brazil, in terms of knowing the whole, um, the whole, the flora of the whole country and what what you can eat. He's got more of an overview of, of it than anybody. And I asked him what his favourite plant was. He said this. Did he? I can't even believe it. I completely overlooked so this What's it plant. called? Gallant soldier, but this one is an invasive from South America. So we've we've got local um, or a local organic farm has got it. It's just everywhere because somebody donated some compost from from their garden, had the seeds in, oh. and now gallant soldier everywhere. Which again, he thinks is a curse, but we think it's a great. Yeah, it's a gift because we just go and fantastic mop it up. Yeah. Well, well, well. What have we got under the vest, man? No, there's always one more. Like I said, there's always one more. <laughs> That's the rocket growing up there, but it's got some kind of mildewy thing. But this thing here. Which looks a lot like the uh, smooth south thistle, but that's actually um, wall lettuce. I think it's probably the prettiest of all those plants. Oh, it's got yeah, a real yeah. sort of architecture yeah. to it, and you can tell it by these delicate little uh, flowers that don't look so much like a daisy. But yeah, yeah. Most of the other ones in this family are very daisy-like, but that's got sort of five distinct. It's like someone weed killer on this, isn't it? No, I think it's mildew. Is it? Yeah. For some reason, there's another cabbage family one over there that's got mildew on it, so it's obviously a mildew that attacks. Yeah. Cabbage family things. Oh, right, salad is served. Fantastic. Who would have known that was on the garden that no one uses? It always just makes me feel how, how friendly things are. Yeah. <laughs> is it equivalent um, to being about 40 supermarket salads? Probably? It is. <laughs> I think so.